Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Poston, Regional Director for the National Trust for Historic Preservation for the Southwest Region, located in Fort Worth, Texas. Jonathan. Thank you very much, Ernesto. It's a pleasure to be here and back in New Mexico. Uh, I try to get here as often as possible as one of the four states that the Southwest Office serves as in our capacity as Regional Office for the National Trust. I want to say a particular thanks to all of us here on the panel who are here today, but also to uh, any Pueblo governors, former governors, tribal leaders, and Pueblo leaders who are here, to governmental officials. I know Cal Curley is here from Senator Udall's office, um, to particularly thank the um, Indian Pueblo Cultural Center and its staff, um, and, um, and thank them for allowing us to have this uh, announcement here today. I'm Jonathan Poston. I am the regional director, as Ernesto said, for the Southwest Office of the Trust. And as Ernesto mentioned, the National Trust chartered in 1949 uh, as the national nonprofit preservation organization for the United States. And it, the National Trust brings people together to protect, enhance, and enjoy the places that matter to them by saving the places where great moments from history and the important moments from everyday life took place. The National Trust for Historic Preservation works to revitalize neighborhoods and communities, to spark economic development and promote environmental sustainability. Our headquarters in Washington is served also by eight regional and field offices, 29 historic sites. One of them is a coast stewardship site here in New Mexico, which Teresa Pasquale directs, um, and that is the Acoma Pueblo site and also various statewide and local partner organizations throughout the country. The National Trust's uh, field, uh, or excuse me, regional office uh, in Fort Worth, which covers Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, um, is uh, an office that through a very small staff, we provide preservation services, including technical assistance, organizational development, advocacy, and small grants to help spur preservation activity at the grassroots level and to facilitate protection of important places in the Southwest. I wanted to particularly mention that Victoria Jacobson, who is the president of the New Mexico Preservation Alliance, is here today. And the New Mexico Preservation Alliance, uh, Heritage Preservation Alliance, excuse me, Vicki, is our official statewide partner um, in New Mexico and helps guide us in all our work here uh, and how we may assist. But um, America's 11 most endangered places uh, has over the nearly 20 years that it has been being promulgated by the National Trust uh, annually has identified more than 200 threatened one-of-a-kind historic places, historic treasures. Uh, some of these sites are urban districts or rural landscapes, Native American landmarks, 20th century sports arenas, um, entire communities or single buildings, and in some cases whole cities, or in this case of this year, even state threats are highlighted by the 11 most in danger. But we're here today to primarily announce uh, that the National Trust for Historic Preservation names the Greater Chaco Landscape in New Mexico to its 2011 list of America's 11 most endangered places. The National Trust has named the Greater Chaco Landscape in New Mexico to this list, which highlights important examples of the nation's architectural, cultural, and natural heritage that are at risk of destruction or irreparable damage. Um, across a swath of northwestern New Mexico are hundreds of sites that help unlock the mysteries of the Chacoan people, prehistoric farmers who inhabited the area for six centuries starting in 700 AD. Today, these great innovators are represented by descendant Pueblo and other Native American groups. The architecture and engineering prowess of the Chacoan people suggest a highly developed culture known for magnificent multi-story buildings, uh, for using masonry techniques that were unique for their time. The Chacoan people constructed these massive stone buildings or great houses, often containing hundreds of rooms. Although some Chacoan sites are now in ruins, others uh, have features that are remarkably intact. The legacy of the Chacoan people includes thousands of ancient pueblos and shrines, along with an extensive road network 
that provided a physical and cultural link for people across the region. Sites within Chaco Canyon itself and some nearby mesas are protected as part of the Chaco Culture National Historic Park, which is managed by the National Park Service. The international significance of this region, which includes the Aztec Ruins National Monument and Salmon Ruins, is exemplified by the designation of the park as a World Heritage Property, a World Heritage Site, which is only one of, such, of 20 such World Heritage Sites in the United States. It is the natural and cultural landscape as a whole, and not just individual sites, however, that make the Chacoan region worthy of protection. Yet most Chacoan sites and roads are located on federal lands outside the park and World Heritage boundaries. And these are at risk from a variety of human activities, including most significantly energy development. Many of these sites and roads rival those located within the park for example, the recently mapped culturally significant Great North Road, which you'll be hearing more about in a minute from our next speaker, which runs dozens of miles towards the New Mexico-Colorado border, remains vulnerable to development and other land disturbing activities. The, our president, Stephanie Meeks, said this morning, the greater Chaco landscape has tremendous religious and cultural significance for many Native American tribes and is recognized around the world for its historic and cultural significance. In a densely populated and developed country like ours, it is hard to imagine that there is still a place where someone can walk in the footsteps of the Chacoan people through a landscape that has remained virtually unchanged for centuries. We cannot stand back and witness insensitive energy development and the permanent scarring of a place that holds deep significance for hundreds of thousands of people around the globe. Today, the greater Chaco landscape of northwestern New Mexico is experiencing a boom in energy resource exploration and extraction. The oil and gas industry continues to push for development on federal lands outside the Chaco Culture National Historic Park and has recently nominated several Bureau of Land Management parcels within this area for oil and gas lease sales. In addition, many subtle and fragile Chacoan roads are greatly endangered as modern roads are being built and planned to serve the heavy truck traffic associated with energy extraction. Well, the greater Chacoan landscape was nominated to America's 11 most endangered places by the Solstice Project, a nonprofit organization based in New Mexico. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce the nominator of this 11 most, uh, Anna, Anna Sophia, the president of the Solstice Project. It's really a pleasure for me to be here to celebrate what I think is a tremendous action by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It's a very significant step in the recognition of, of, of the vulnerability of Chaco sites to this current surge of energy interest, which we see every day increasing, especially north of Chaco Canyon where, as Jonathan mentioned, the Great North Road, we're just beginning to understand, uh, is a very significant uh, construction of the Pueblo people, the ancient Pueblo people, because it, from our study of it way back in the mid-'80s, we had a hunch that that massive construction, parallel routes averaging 30 feet each one across, rigorously straight, that it might not be about trade and transportation. And with uh, going out on, in the field with several really fine archaeologists who understood what they were looking at, which is very difficult with Chaco roads because they are so subtle, we found very little functional use for this road. Uh, the sites along it are really shrine-like sites, ritual architecture, the few that are there. and. It seems now that it connects the ceremonial center of Chaco Canyon, where the great famous Pueblo Benito Chetra Kettle are. The roots of it go up the steep cliff there. They join at Pueblo Alto, another very large building. And there, the North Road begins its course directly north to Pierre's, which is a set of hills with kivas and other shrine-like structures. And then it goes north again from there another 15 miles and drop or 20 miles and drops in to Coots Canyon at the very steepest edge of Coots Canyon 
And I worked with Mike Marshall, a, a very experienced Chaco archaeologist. And it was very significant that at that spot, we found a stairway and broken pots along the stairway. And of all our work with Chaco, which goes back um, over three decades, it is this finding that seems to resonate and have particular significance. All, all of it has resonated with, with Pueblo people as we've shared our findings. But I have to say, the Great North Road seems to have a profound resonance. Um, and they speak in our film, The Mystery of Chaco Canyon, which, by the way, is going back on PBS tonight. <laughs> But in it, uh, Paul Pino from Laguna, Ed Ladd, the uh, late, wonderful Ed Ladd from Zuni, they speak of its significance in a spiritual sense, that it connects the realm of the living with the realm of the dead, the direction north, which is a particularly significant direction to Pueblo people. Um, so to, have, to be out there and to see, and we have photos we can share with you, the um, the subtle road of such importance to the Pueblo people a thousand years ago crossed today by modern roads serving oil and gas sites to the right and left, to the east and the west of it, is very upsetting, discouraging. Uh, so I think we're at the beginning of what we have to continue to press for, which is action by the agencies in charge, the BLM particularly, to put a recognition on this road that it, there's a certain corridor of a certain width where that kind of activity cannot take place. And I hope, too, that eventually we'll have the resources to continue to um, record it. The LIDAR that the Trust supported for us last spring had exceptional results. Because for years, from the, oh, the late 70s through, uh, the 90s, the early 90s, people were out there, archaeologists, they're slaving in the heat, in the cold. You know, Chaco is not an easy environment. But with the roads, particularly, it's difficult. It's not like digging a building, as they do so quite easily. The roads you have to pick up with aerial imagery, old photos from the 1930s, 1960s. And then you don't really know where you are when you look at the photo. You try to match it with something on a topo map, but it is so flat and just sort of an undulating plano out there. You, it's like, to me, it's like being in the middle of the sea. You can be down a little trough, and you don't even see a further peak. Um, you are, it's a nowhere feeling, which I think is part of why it's, it's so exceptional an experience. But, um, that tedious work where they went out and they had groups of people to go in a line to find where is this road. We see it here in a piece, a fragment there. Um, how do we piece this whole thing together? And they, they did a pretty good job. But it was the LIDAR that picked it up overnight, even to the point where a road three and a half inches deep that you could not see in any other aerial imagery or on the ground by any means showed up in the LIDAR for quite a stretch. And it's because these linear features show up against this very empty plano. There's nothing to distract you. And you know they're different from modern roads because they are so straight. So that's been a, a huge success. And it's helped us have data for the agencies to protect this, um, these linear features more than they have to date. And it's also um, giving us promise for what should be done for the roads throughout the Chaco region. And Jonathan talked about what I think is so important, um, that we originally really, people did a good job. They saw the big buildings of Chaco. They put a big fence around them. They put even fences around some of the outlying ones, uh, Aztec, Kinviniola, Pintado. But um, Chaco is so much more. It's about a regional landscape. And we know it particularly from the roads. And we know that the roads are not for trade and transportation. Here's how you know a road. You know it by a linear scatter of shards, broken pieces of pottery. And you know it by shrines, these C-shaped, low-walled sites about 10 to 15 feet across. If you find those, you have a road. There's a road there. And if you walk in that region and t see if there are other artifacts, there are not but you'll find a line of broken ceramic pieces. So um, that 
plus the fact that they do not, well, there may be some that connect to the forests of the Chuska Mountains, Mount Taylor, and maybe they were used for bringing timber in, but we don't find uh, a road neck work, work that expresses um, a function of trade and transportation, and that's what's so interesting. The North Road not only connects to North and seems to commemorate North, which is so much commemorated in Chaco, we have markings that occur just when the sun reaches the north-south line in the sky, the meridian. And we have the exact north-south alignment of certain kivas and of Pueblo Benito. So we know the north-south meridian line is important in the cosmology of Chaco people. But what's so extraordinary is to take it out 35 miles with parallel routes 30 feet across. Um, then the south road, we looked at that at the same time. It's also 35 miles, and it does not go to connect building to building or to resources. It goes up across south of Crown Point, across the Mesa. You walk across, you follow the shards again, and you are on the road. Then you come out of a wooded area, and there's a shrine, and you look across this valley to the sweeping, almost like Devil's Tower, Hosta Butte, about 600 feet high in front of you. Again, what we've called cosmography, the connecting of the center, the ceremonial heart of Chaco, with this very important landscape, sacred landscape, these pieces of topography that stand out and are so significant. So just to emphasize again what the trust has done here and what Jonathan expressed, we are engaged in trying to understand Chaco as a much bigger world than what appears obvious in some four-story buildings in the center, but is really an expression a thousand years ago across an area of 250 miles north-south, 250 miles east-west, barely understood, barely documented, and highly vulnerable because, ironically, it's the center in this region, perhaps more than most places in the world, of uranium, coal, gas, and oil. And we all know the pressure to develop those today. So thank you, Trust, for taking us on and doing such a nice gesture. It's beyond a gesture, a great step. Thanks. Thank you, Anna, for your perspectives and giving us, you know, putting it in context, putting this entire landscape in context. Thank you for the work that the Solstice Project does with regard to the Chacoan landscape. And, uh, Thank you, more importantly, for the nomination of uh, Chacoan Landscape as one of America's most endangered places. The National Trust has a unique position in terms of the way it operates. It has a Board of Trustees, but in addition to a Board of Trustees, it also has a Board of Advisors. Two advisors from each state and also from the uh, territories. We serve as advisors to the National Trust. We are the eyes and ears, so to speak, of the uh, National Trust in our respective states. My cohort, Teresa Pascual, and I, you know, have this excellent working relationship with the National Trust, with Jonathan and his staff at Fort Worth. But as we stated earlier, Teresa also has another hat that she wears and that is as Director of Cultural Preservation for the Pueblo of Acoma. And we'd like to have Teresa provide some perspectives, tribal perspectives, on this particular nomination. Teresa? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. What a wonderful day it is. It is a wonderful day here in New Mexico to celebrate the listing of the Chaco landscape to the 11 most endangered places with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I am honored in my capacity as director for the Pueblo of Acoma for Historic Preservation to be able to speak to you this morning about the importance of preserving such rich cultural and historical places here in the state of New Mexico. If you ask Puebloan and tribal people about the importance 
of Chaco and its resources, both archaeological and historical even resources within the park and outside of the park boundary, the people will often refer to those resources as living places. Oftentimes we hear from archaeologists and anthropologists of those places being referred to places of the past, of ruins, of places that have long been abandoned by, by ancestral people. Our people here in the state of New Mexico, the descendants of those ancestors, know very well that those are living, breathing places. We are really here in the Southwest, here in the state of New Mexico, at a crucial crossroads in terms of development of renewable energy here in the state. We have wonderful resources that draw numerous visitors to our state here. People who come to see Puye Cliffs, who come to see Bandelier, Aztec, Chaco National Park, who come to enjoy our state parks, our rivers, our lakes, who spend hundreds if not thousands, and I would dare say millions of dollars to come and enjoy our cultural and historical and natural resources. We are at a crossroads because we are at a time in which we are also pressured with the development of energy sources here in the state. The development of oil and gas, coal, uranium. We are looking at other renewable resources such as solar and wind. But it comes at a time where planning and management is at its most crucial time. The development of those resources cannot come at the cost of destroying such a rich and diverse heritage that is not just the heritage and history of Puebloan and tribal people in this state. It is the rich cultural history of all of us here in New Mexico and all of us as citizens of the United States. This is our story. This is our history. And today's listing celebrates and reaffirms the richness and the beauty of that history and of that culture. We are at a point in time in which we are just beginning to understand that history. If you talk to tribal and Puebloan people, they will tell you that they have been in these places since time immemorial. And if we look at our understanding, our scientific understanding, our analysis of these places, it really is only a fraction of a second on that timeline. We are only beginning to understand the importance, the cultural richness, the scientific impact that those resources could have in our understanding of our relationship to the greater world. It is why this listing reaffirms for tribes and for Puebloan people what we have said all along to those agencies and to those entities in which they manage these cultural resources to say these places are places that are living and breathing to us. They are places, they are chapters of our history, chapters of our history book. Many of our tribes and our pueblos here in the Southwest and especially here in New Mexico are still oral based in tradition. They do not have a written language. The Pueblo of Acoma is one of those Pueblos that does not have a written language. Our history, what we teach our children, what we pass on to our community, generation after generation is written on that landscape. And so when we look at development coming in and as they change the physical characteristics of that landscape, it is for us, 
for us as traditional communities, simply erasing the chapters of that history book. Once those pages no longer exist, you cannot rewrite those pages. They are gone simply forever. So it is very crucial and critical that we recognize our impacts to living, breathing communities and cultures right here in our state and here in the Southwest and across the nation. And if we look internationally, we can look at the impacts to other indigenous cultures beyond our boundaries. We are all interconnected in what we do. And we have, as we move forward, the ability to create change, the ability to manage properly, the ability to develop resources that also pr protect our cultural heritage. That is what is key. The National Trust for Historic Preservation works very hard to help communities recognize the importance of saving places that matter, saving the stories that connect us to place, that give us a sense of who we are and tell our story. That is why today's listing is very important because it protects for us that history that we will pass down to our children generation after generation. And so I am pleased as a Puebloan woman, as the director for the Pueblo of Acoma's Preservation Office and pleased as an advisor to the National Trust that the National Trust for Historic Preservation has made its decision to list this landscape to reaffirm what we all know as being a place of significance, of being a place of cultural and religious importance to us but also sends a very strong message to those who manage these resources that we truly must find opportunities to become partners as we move forward in our development of these resources. And I would also like to thank our preservation partners, the New, Mexican, uh, New Mexico Heritage Preservation Alliance for your support uh, of our preservation efforts um, within tribal communities, as well as our partners in the field, like Anna Sofer and the Solstice Project, whose work throughout the years has reaffirmed what we all as Pueblo and tribal people know, that our people were capable of building some of the most beautiful and wonderful masterpieces in that period of time that we all now recognize as being natural and archeological wonders of the world. So thank you, and thank you to the National Trust. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you.